Barielle Heller plays Alma in The Queen's Gambit, the Netflix limited series. I'm Matt Noble of Gold Derby. Here to ask you, Marielle, what was the most challenging thing about playing Alma? The thing I was the most nervous about was having to play the piano because I don't play the piano. <laughs> and I took piano lessons to get ready for it. And I really wanted it to look authentic because I don't know, I've directed movies where people played the piano before. Like I had Tom Hanks playing the piano and Marianne his, who played Joanne Rogers in my Mr. Rogers movie. And I just really had a thing in my head about not making that look fakey. So I was really stuck on that. But Scott Frank kept being like, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. We'll fake it. And so I spent all this time taking piano lessons and then you never really see my hands. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, yeah, it's good. Could Tom could Tom Hanks play the piano or not? No, <laughs> so. no. But Marianne, who played his wife, does play the piano. Mm. Who played Joanne Rogers, and she spent so long learning this piece. And I put her in the foreground and him in the background. And I remember the joy on his face when we we brought out his piano. The scene is there, and they have two pianos next to each other playing this duet. And he. Um, the way you film it is you deaden the piano so you can press the yeah. keys and it's no sound. Mm -hmm. And then we were playing the track that they were playing along to and Marianne is just frantically trying to follow it perfectly. And he's just happily playing. I remember the joy on his face, like, I feel like I'm really playing the piano. This is so fun. <laughs> That's great. Like, yeah, he's, he's only used to the giant pianos that you jump on usually. <laughs> yeah, <It's> like, exactly. <laughs> So, He's like, I play with my hands? I, yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, what with Alan, so like obviously you're most nervous about the piano playing, but what was the most important thing about that character to get right? For me, she, the thing that I kind of connected in with her was her pain. You know, she's a woman who, if she had been born in a different era, could have had a very different life. She wanted to be a piano player, wanted to be a concert pianist, wanted to be a mother. She's kind of stuck in this loveless marriage when we meet her. And in so many ways, her life, you can just feel it was not what she wanted it to be. It hasn't turned out the way she hoped. And there's this deep pain, but then there is the kind of restraints of the era and the way that she kind of keeps herself buttoned up on top of that pain. So kind of playing those two layers against each other, I think was the most, the part I wanted to get right from an emotional point of view. Um, and there were just little uh, kind of breadcrumbs throughout the script that led me to, to figure out what that pain was and how to tap into it. And so I wanted to get those little moments where she just reveals some tiny bit of her past. Oh, you had a child once. Yes, we, we had a child, you know, and letting those tiny, tiny moments reveal the little cracks in the facade. Mm. Well, the interesting thing about your character and all but one character of this uh, series is that we see them through the prism of where they enter into Beth's life and mm -hmm. how they, that, how they impact Beth on her journey and how she's able to impact them um yeah. on their life journey um what was for Alma that relationship with Beth like and and what do you think defines that relationship I mean I loved their relationship I sort of felt like in some funny way they were like each other's soulmates or like loves of each other's lives um and for Alma I felt like what was really a joy to play was starting in that place where she is sort of, she kind of feels like her life is over. She's not even trying to kind of live a life anymore. She's just locked in the house, you know, drinking and um, not having much joy. And then in meeting Beth and in their slowly burgeoning relationship that grows, almost starts to see, oh, she's following her dream. She's actually playing chess and is good at this. Maybe my life isn't over. And it like, wakes up something inside of Alma that I think is, I don't know, it was really touching and sweet to see her kind of recognize, oh, just because you're a girl, you still can play chess. Interesting. What does that mean for me? What did I give up? Um, and so in a lot of ways where we leave with Alma, she's in a much happier place than when we met her. Mm -hmm. Like Alma is not the perfect 
mother. She's got her flaws. And Beth has her flaws too. But it does seem like they sort of needed each other in the time that they found each other. And they give each other what they need. I think if if Alma was a more traditional mother figure, she wouldn't have been the right mother for Beth. Mm. You know, there's something about these two women who are both very, very lonely and haven't had anybody in their lives for so long. And neither of them really knows how to open up to another person. It's like they want to, but they don't know how to. And in some ways, if um, if Alma was more traditional or warm or anything, I think Beth would have been like, ugh. And similar with Beth, if Beth was needier or like, um, a younger child, I think it would have been too much for Alma. So in some ways, I think they met each other where they were. They kind of let each other be who they were. And in that way, they end up, I think it takes time for them to build their relationship and their loving relationship. But then it's more genuine because it's really comes from a place of respect and slowly, slowly, slowly getting to know each other. And then by the end, you know, there's the scene in in Vegas where uh, we kind of have this fight where she says, what do you know about chess? And I say, I know about losing. And now you do too. You know, we have this sort of like the first kind of real conflict between us in a real way. And then the next scene we're driving away and she takes my hand and it feels like, okay, now we're family. Like we've had to build to that moment where the two characters realize they can get through hard times together and actually that they are the only the only person that they can rely on is the other one yeah and I guess like that speaks a lot to like sort of Alma's sort of like life you know you don't know anything about losing and I'm sure she's felt like she's lost a lot in her life and probably has lost a lot in her life what like what was it like playing a character where there is a bit of a wall up and she doesn't just say everything and you sort of like, like a sort of, it peels away as you learn. And there's still, even I think at the end of her arc in the series, still a lot that's left unsaid. Yeah. I mean, that, that sort of feels indicative of playing someone from that era. You know, you're, you're, you're locking into a way of being that is so different from how we are today. I felt every day when I would kind of put on Alma from hair and pin curls for two hours in the morning, sitting under a dryer to like putting on a girdle. And it was like, keep everything locked up, kind of this armor that you put on as a woman in the fifties. And like, what is that? And what are you not supposed to say? It's so different from how I am in my regular life. Um, so it felt it felt sort of like any character in that era has that tight-lipped kind of they only mm-hmm. reveal certain things but that's a fun thing to play against it's like a it's a barrier it's an obstacle that you have to kind of push up against yeah did was there a favorite scene you had in the series to to perform There's one scene that got cut out. I haven't oh. talked about this, but I thought about this recently. I was like, oh, it's too bad on Netflix. You don't have like deleted scenes. Yeah. Um, there was a scene from Beth's first morning when she's just arrived at the house. And then um, the next morning I'm giving her this disgusting tuna casserole to eat and smoking a cigarette. And I like drip ashes in the tuna casserole I can't say it was a favorite scene to film because I almost threw up afterwards from smoking so many cigarettes and um, doing it over and over again and I was really trying to like keep it in my mouth for a long time to get this ash into the casserole it was so gross but it was funny and then we got to the end of filming and I had to like lie on the linoleum for a while and the medic came over to make sure I was okay because I had just lost all color in my face because it was so disgusting but it was a funny fun scene that and um truthfully I liked playing dead um it was like really fun to do the scene where she finds me 
Uh, I took a lot of pride in, you really can't see it in the cut the way it ended up, but there was a version of the scene we did where I'm in the foreground the whole time and I've kept my eyes open the entire time and tried to do really shallow breathing. And I was like in a meditative state to try and stay really, really mm -hmm. still. And everyone in the crew was like, how are you doing that? That is amazing. <laughs> and I just took, um, I just had some kind of sick pleasure in doing that scene. Yeah, and I imagine that's tricky with so much going, like, you know, it seems quiet in the show, but there's like probably a whole bunch of people on set for that moment, making commotion oh, yeah. and distractions and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah, and I was just, I don't know why, I thought it was just so fun and I was just holding back from wanting to like, midway through the scene sit up and scare Anya but I held back because she was having yeah. a real emotional moment yeah what were you thinking as you were lying there dead I wish I could say I was actually like having deep thoughts about the character I was much more um focused on the physical work of trying to keep my eyes open without watering and trying to keep sh shallow breathing so I would look really dead and I just kept trying not to laugh because I really did want to like prank Anya. I wanted to jump up and anytime um, somebody would come up to me and we weren't in the middle of a scene and I would be lying there, I would do that. I would like sit right up in the bed and freak people out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, what do you think, um, the best thing was about, uh, oh, look, look, what, what do you think the most important scene was for Alma in the series? Hands down, there's the scene where I'm playing the piano and I've just found out that my husband has left me and mm -hmm. she comes down the stairs and we have this moment where I, I tell her that he's left and she asks if she could be sent back to Methuen. Um, and we, we decide together in a kind of conspiratorial way to lie. And I say, you know, not if they don't find out. And then we have this moment where I say, I may no longer be a wife, but I think I could be a mother. And for me, that was like the, the linchpin. That, that was the moment I had to nail in order to get our relationship right and to get this woman right. Because I feel like that's then that's my goal for the rest of the series is to try to learn to be a mother as you've said you're a director and a writer as well as uh and I just, what what is that like when you come into a role like this but you've also been from that sort of pers a different perspective on other sets does it affect the way you approach your role definitely um you know the thing that I always said as a director is that being an actor gave me a huge perspective and helped me so much as a director. And then conversely, I think being a director gave me such a wider perspective as an actor coming back to acting after so many years. I felt uh, really comfortable on set, but more the reason I felt really comfortable was mostly because I could see the, the larger machine working behind the scenes. You know, I could recognize that months and months and months of work had been done before I ever arrived on the scene and that the production designer and the costume designers and the hair and makeup people have all been thinking about my character and are there to support me. And it made me feel so comforted and it made me realize like, it's not really all about what I'm doing here. I'm just here at the very end to kind of carry this forward, but all this creative work has already been done and that we're really a much bigger, more complex, team than I think I knew before I started directing. You know, there's just hundreds of people on set who are all there working toward the same goal. And you realize like, I'm a, I'm part of a team. I'm not here alone. Mm. Yeah. Um, can you think of a particular uh, scene or moment in shooting sort of the first sort of, uh, or not the first scene, the only season of this limited series where you um, sort of, saw that bigger picture or like that your sort of mind as a director was sort of triggered? Um, I mean, my mind as a director is always triggered. It's an impossible thing to turn off. But yeah. I will say one moment I had was the first time I got to see my house. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I got to see the way the production designer and Scott had envisioned this character through how my house was decorated. And it was so over the top. And the patterns on the walls, the wallpaper, everything is so um, oppressive and clashy and so many patterns. And I realized like, oh, this is a huge clue into my character. And if I can pay attention to these things, I can learn so much about who I am, and who this woman is and the kind of weird prison she's built for herself in this house where she's not allowed to have her own animals, but she has the animals decorating the walls and this like flowery wallpaper in every room. Um, and so that was a real moment of showing up on set and walking around and going, oh, okay. I understand more who I am playing now. Like this gives me a huge clue. Yeah. How much of yourself do you bring to the role of Alba? Um, my joke was always that I was playing a drunk housewife and that was typecasting, but it's not true. <laughs> um, um, not a lot. I mean, she's not, you know, she's not like me. But what I could relate to, I think, or could imagine was what it would be like to be a woman who couldn't follow her dreams, her artistic pursuits. You know, it made me feel really lucky for the era I live in and for my own life. But I could easily imagine what that would feel like if you had these unrequited dreams and these ideas of who you could have been if you had been born in a different era. I think that was the thing I could really... I could really relate to, I could imagine what that would feel like. And it, and it felt really poignant to me. Mm. And to finish off, Marielle, what do you think, like the thinking more broadly about the series, the Queen's Gambit, what do you think is the driving sort of message of the series or the sort of constant that runs through that um, all the episodes? That's a good question. I don't, You know, I mean, I think we've all said the show is not really about chess. It's um, it's much more a coming of age story and about the cost of genius and what what it is to be a talent. And um, it feels much more like a sports movie in that way of somebody who is you know, you're so on Beth's side from the very beginning of this series and you're just rooting for her. But I think obviously the themes of addiction and Mm. substance abuse and whether genius causes madness were all of the juicy, interesting things that Scott was delving into and trying to discover with the series. Mm. What what I sort of realized watching the final, and even though your character's not in it, is that uh, like I sort of realized, oh, this has been a real ensemble show. Yeah. Like, as we see all the characters come back and all the, like, even things that, like, even the house and things with with your character and stuff, I think, oh, like, I was so focused on Beth, I didn't realise how many other big characters there were. It's a satisfying scene, right, when you realise she has a village and she's not Mm. alone and you get to see, like, that she has built a community of people who are supporting her in the end. And I think that's right. I think in so many ways, what we get to know Beth in how she relates to all of the people she comes across in her travels and in her life journey Mm. and how they change her and get her to the point where she is. Cause she obviously could go down a much darker path. Mm. Yeah. They help save her. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. All the best of luck, Marielle, for the upcoming Emmy Awards for yourself and Queen's Gambit. Thank you. No worries. 